We're so glad you're here, and I want to thank you again for, for your kindness regarding pastor appreciation, and boy, I sure do love you, and so sure are grateful for you. And today we have a, to speak to us a dear friend of mine, Pastor Scott Card. Now, Pastor Scott is not here because of Pastor Appreciation Day. I actually already had him booked to preach, and we just went ahead and did Pastor Appreciation Day today. The reason he's here is he's such a fantastic minister of the gospel. I wanted him to be a blessing to this church. I've known uh, Pastor Scott a long time. Uh, in fact, he was the youth pastor at the church I was born into uh, when I was born. So when I tell you I've known him a while, I've known him a while. And I sure do love him. His, his wife, Leah, her dad was my pastor growing up. My first sermon was because of your dad, Leah, and I'm so grateful he gave me that chance. So anything you don't like, blame Leah's dad. That's what you need to know. <laughs> we love the Cardin so much, and I'm so grateful. Would you welcome me to, uh, join me today in welcoming Pastor Scott Cardin? Love you, buddy. Love you. Appreciate you. It is a joy and honor to be in the house of God in Lebanon, Tennessee. Amen. I'm glad you introduced me as pastor because I thought I'm not an evangelist, but I did sleep in a Holiday Inn Express last night, so <laughs> we're ready to go. It is an honor to be in this pulpit, and I love Drew and his family, and Stephanie and Allie, will, I will win her over eventually. Amen. So, And I know this pulpit, the Word of God comes from this thing because I know this young man. Amen. So I, I consider this a, a truly an honor and a, a blessing to be able to preach here. And if you want to turn with me, I'd just rather go right in the Word of God. Is that okay? If you want to turn to John chapter 20, verses 19 through 23. While you're turning, I like hearing pages turn or digital things that don't make sounds or whatever. Bring your word to the church of God. Amen. Bring your, bring your word ever how you do it. Amen. But the book of John 20, 19 through 23. Lord, just laid a, a simple thought on my mind, and, and I will apologize up front. I have been at the Inglewood Church of God for almost 27 years. It is the first church I've ever pastored. Hopefully will be the last one I ever pastor, but we'll, 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 we'll wait and see. Uh, no, but that is my point of reference. I was a youth pastor throughout the state of Tennessee for about 10 years and loved every minute of it, had no intentions of ever pastoring, and here we are. If you don't know anything about Inglewood, Tennessee, I understand. There's not much to know. It has a population of 1,510 people. We have two red lights and a subway, and that's not a train that goes under the ground. That's a, that's a little place that sells sandwiches. Amen. That's what we got. We had a family dollar and a dollar store. Now we have a dollar general marketplace and two empty buildings in our town. So that's what we got. We sit on the curve in the middle of town, and I will probably tell a few stories of what's happened at the Inglewood Church of God, because we serve a great and mighty God. Amen. And when we talk about speaking the name of Jesus, I stand here to let you know, with Jesus, all things are possible, and in God, nothing is impossible. I love that that phrase is repeated twice. No matter how you want to say it, it will come across so that you understand it. And I want you to know, no matter how you've entered this building this no morning, no matter what, what's brought you here this morning, we serve a God who is great enough and powerful enough and loving enough and caring enough to meet you where you are. Amen. And I, you know, I expect God to do great things this morning. So if you'll just look at the word this morning, we'll try to dig in and see where God takes us. It says, then, and I love when God shows up then, the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for the fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them 
Oh, God, that you would breathe on us one more time. He breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. And if you forgive any, uh, the sins of any, they will be forgiven. Then if you retain the sins, they will be retained. I want to speak for just a few moments on a simple thought. Breathe on us. Lord, amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, with great joy, it is to be in your house. And I thank you for these have brought us to a place of, of worship and praise and adoration of you, God. And I'm thankful that your word of promise where two or three are gathered in your name. You, you are here in the midst of us, God. Now I simply ask that you would anoint me to preach your word, but more than anoint us all that we would hear your word and receive your word. May your word fall on good ground this morning, and I'm going to give you praise and glory and honor, God, for the power of your word and what's going to take place in this place this morning. And everybody said amen. amen. Jesus had just been crucified a few days ago in this text. I don't know if you know, a couple weeks ago we had this thing called Easter. I hope you, I hope you were here. Amen. And then the news is out. The tomb is empty. There is mass confusion. There is fear. People don't know what's going on. The disciples don't have it all figured out. They don't know all the answers. And I, that's kind of where I want to start. So many people enter church and sometimes they say, Pastor, I, I, I love the Lord, but I, I don't have everything figured out. I got good news for you. That, that's all of us. Amen. So I love the fact that the disciples who had served and followed Jesus for over three years, now hearing everything that he said, they're about to put all the pieces of the puzzle together, but now they are up in an upper room, possibly the room to where they had the last supper, possibly in a place very familiar to them, but they are locked up in a room out of fear because they don't know what's all going on. Amen. Anybody been there? Two people. You're the honest people in this place. Come on. But they are gathered in this room, fearful for what's taking place, fearful what might happen to their lives, trying to figure out what's going on. And I love the fact that it is not the expectation of Jesus as Savior for them to figure out how to get to Jesus. I love in the simplicity of this recorded story in Scripture that Jesus comes to them. And there are barriers for Jesus to come to them because they're hiding out and they have locked the door. But Jesus shows up anyway. And I don't know where you're at. And I don't know what room you feel like you're locked in. And I don't know if it's a jail cell of your own bitterness or unforgiveness or the sin in your life or addiction or whatever. But I'm telling you, Jesus is not afraid and Jesus is not uh, put outside. Jesus has the ability and the desire to come meet you where you are, amen. But more than that, he has something to offer us when he does show up in the room, amen. And I love that when God shows up in a place, it cannot contain the power in the presence amen I love that two disciples later on beat to death almost worshiping God in a prison cell in the middle of the night and when Jesus showed up where two or three are gathered I will be there that room could no longer hold all three of them and the doors are falling off the hinges I got a message this morning a word for you this morning God can remove the barriers in your life to where they are hanging on old hinges and I'm telling somebody do not give up right now God is about to move in your life last Sunday I, I preached and I love the Sloans are here somewhere I was afraid they was going to hear the same sermon twice there you are way over there you never sat on this side at my church you are always over here you have to sit in the same place every week what's wrong with you people no. but a little thought came to me after this and that's what I preached last week and that's kind of where we're at in, in this text here the disciples spent three years with Jesus. They saw great miracles. They saw everything going on. Then they saw him crucified. And then they saw him laid in a tomb. And now they've got an empty tomb. And after this, after all that they've seen and after all that they've gone through, Jesus shows up. Many of us today, many of us this morning, we're living in a period of time in our life that I would say is after this. God has been good to you. God has blessed you. But now things are not maybe going the way that you all think they ought to and you're struggling in, in your faith or you may be at a point that you just don't understand what's going to take place tomorrow we're all living in a moment after this but I love again the fact that when we're living in the after this moments Jesus is going to come to us and help us and the first thing that Jesus did 
when he entered that room, he said, peace be to you. He, he offered peace to them. And the Bible tells us he's not given us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. Amen. Fear is the very opposite of faith. Amen. And we've lived our fearful seasons, and I'm not even going to call it by name anymore. We have made it through that, and it, it is not God's will that we live in fear. And I'm glad again that he did not enter the room in condemnation, saying, what's wrong with you people? But he came and said, I give you peace. Amen. Why? Because that was the need they had. They were in fear, and Jesus offered them peace. If you've got a need this morning, he's able to meet your need the Bible says, according to his riches and glory. Hallelujah. So no matter what we bring into the building, we have a Savior who's able to meet that need. And he said, peace be to you. And then he showed him his hands. Now this is, this is what I love. The hands of Jesus. I begin to think of those guys, the 11 guys gathered in that room. And Jesus said, see my hands. You begin to think about the hands of Jesus. You begin to think about all the disciples had seen. You begin to think about all the incredible things that happened through the hands of Jesus. So my mind, my mind starts running a little bit, and I begin to think of all the things that Jesus did. If we want to walk through the scriptures for a few moments, when we, we see that he healed the unclean leopard, then it said, then Jesus put out his hand and touched him. Not going to bore you to death? You're not supposed to touch lepers. Especially in the years that Jesus lived. It made you unclean. If you was unclean, then you had to go through ritual washings, and then you couldn't enter into the, the, to the temple, or you couldn't go worship God. You couldn't gather together in the synagogue. You, had to, you were unclean and all these things. You weren't supposed to touch lepers. I'm glad of the fact that Jesus Christ showed him his hands, the hands that at one time touched the leper. But not only did he touch him, he healed him. Amen. And then I began to think a little bit more about what, what happened here. You know, when he, when he asked him, to that, I, I love the fact that he asked that leper, I'm, uh, are you willing to, uh, to be clean? He said, I'm willing and immediately the leper was cleansed. I love the fact that he healed the blind. The Bible says then he came to Bethsaida and they brought a blind man to him and begged Jesus to touch him. And then he healed the deaf. And the Bible says in Mark 7, 34, and he put his fingers in his ears and touched his tongue. Hallelujah. Then I got to thinking about Peter's mother-in-law. So he said, and he, so he touched her hand and the fever left her. Amen. And then I got to thinking about how that through the hands, uh, there was resurrection power. He's walking into a room of a guy that really wasn't even hardly a believer that was trying to figure out Jairus. And I'll, I'll add a little bit to that story. I love the fact that when Jairus come to Jesus said, I need you to come to my house. My, my child is dying. And Jesus said, let's go, but on the way. We kind of convolute the story sometimes. I love both of these stories, but they happened almost simultaneously. While they were walking to Jairus' house to heal, to meet that need, this woman who was unclean for years and years and years slithers through the crowd like a snake or really like a dog in which she was treated and in her mind said, if I can touch the hem of his garment, I will be healed. Amen. And that unclean woman reached out, touched Jesus. He stops in his track and says, time out. Somebody touched me. And I love the disciples. They're like, Lord, everybody's touching you. What are you talking about? He said, no, I felt power come out of me. And he looks down and he sees that outcast woman. He sees that woman that nobody could help. He sees that woman that could no longer really be around anybody else because of her condition and she was cleansed and about that time they come and say Jairus no need for the man of God to come your child has passed away I'm glad Jesus is not too busy for all of us amen man we got up we, we, we got a boatload of needs but we have a savior that's able to meet every one of them so he said, no, we're going on to your house, Jairus. Let's go on. He walks in that room. 
They've already got the mourners because if you had any wealth or whatever, the more you could have, the more people weeped and wailed, the better it made you look kind of deal. So they're already tuned up and they're going and they're wailing and they're mourning and they're crying and they're, they're screaming. And Jesus walks in and as, as good as Jesus can, and I hear people all the time say, you know, the Holy Spirit, that they're gentlemen. Sometimes I don't find that in the Bible. You, the, when he cleansed out the temple, that wasn't real gentlemanly, amen. And when the Holy Spirit come roaring down the street, amen, like a sounding of a mighty train, a rushing wind, amen, and tongues of fire set upon them. I love the fact that when Jesus needs to intervene, he'll intervene. He walked in that room and said, what's wrong with you people? Why are you doing? She's not dead. She's asleep. They laughed and mocked at him till he said, leave. In East Tennessee, there's the door. And I'm telling you, there are, I, this is a side note. There are times in your life that you need to remove some of the voices and some of the hindrances and some of the unbelief and some of the things that people are trying to do to pull you back. You, we, we have to change our direction sometimes. Amen. We got to change the crowd we run around with. And Jesus cleaned the room out. Amen. And when he got rid of all the naysayers and the doubters and those that didn't believe, when he cleaned all that out of the room, then he went up to the little girl and he reached down and he touched her. Amen. He touched a dead body and he told her, wake up, little lamb. Amen. I love the fact that he spoke that to her and her eyes opened immediately and she came forth. When those disciples saw the hands of Jesus, their mind had to be racing of all all the things he ever done and I'm glad that his hand is still reaching out to us and I'm glad we can still, no pun intended we can still see the handiwork of God Almighty through the hands of Jesus like I say I, I pastor a, a church in a tiny town on a curve that's, that's our designation because there's a, another church with the church of God name on the hill so we're in the curve, they're up on the hill but when I begin to think of what God's done, I don't want to bore you to death, but 26 and a half years ago, Lee and I rolled in to a church that was dying. That my clerk said, we need stamps, Pastor, but we don't have money to get them. Don't go get them yet. Hallelujah. The church that once had thrived a little bit in a small town was dwindling. And I rode into that town. There's 10 churches in Inglewood. So I said, Lord, if you could just give me a tithe of this town, I think that would be good. Yeah, I did. I, you know, it's not about a number, but I thought I'll, I'll claim my tenth. I'll, I'll ask God to tithe 150 people. It's about all our little building would hold. I went to a revival shortly thereafter. Our choir was singing at the Madisonville Church of God, and there was an evangelist with a bright purple suit on. It uh, looked like Barney had blowed up all over the place, but there he was. And we're singing and worshiping, and we're having a good time, and he calls me up. Never met him. I just got to Inglewood, and he went to lay his hands on me, and he whispered in my ear and said, What you've asked God is not enough. And he laid his hands on me. And I was slain in the spirit, I guess, for the only time in my life, face down. And I got up off the ground and said, I, I, forgive me, Lord, for I'm afraid I have made my tent stakes too small. So I began to say, whatever you want to do, Lord. So there we are at Inglewood. And let me say this. We have prayed multiple times uh, as God began to bring people in and we gather you. We prayed a prayer that if, if you've prayed it, get ready. Lord, send whoever you will. I'm going to tell you for a fact, he will do that. It may not be who you had in mind. But when you lay out whoever you will, you better take whoever comes in. I may draw crazy people like a bug zapper, but that's all right. Amen. That's what God's called us. But I tell you what did start happening. We had a man in our town. Again, it's a small town. It's Mayberry. Everybody knows everybody. And there was a young man named David Marcoux. I didn't know he was a young man. He was 49 years old. I thought he was like 79 years old. He'd been an alcoholic since he was nine years old. He slept in the doorways of some of our little businesses and stores. He walked around the town. He, his, 
his infirmity, his alcoholism had affected the way he walked. He wasn't really able to control his legs anymore. And so he had that, we called it the Jake leg, kind of that's in my area. So you would see him walking around, but he, he would slip in our little church. And our church was uh, just shotgun, two, two rows with a eight by eight four year out back with two bathrooms on it. And, and he would stand and the, they'd open up the door sometimes because uh, it was just hard for people to get in. And I, I would see David, he'd be back there and he'd be patting his feet. And he liked the music. And then one day he come to the altar, and I said, "What, well, David, how can I, what do you need? He said, well, I got some problems. So we prayed. David kept hanging around. He kept hanging around. Then one Sunday we had built our new building, and he came in, and he came to the altar. I said, what do you need, David? He said, I'm an alcoholic, and I need help. And I'd never done it. I do it all the time now, but I'd never done it at that point. I just stopped in my tracks, and I said, I want any man in this room that's been set free from alcohol to come gather around this man because we're going to pray for deliverance. Well, here come my elders, and here come some of my musicians, and here come my Sunday school teachers, and fours over there, about 50 or 60 men gathered around. David Marku. First of all, I thought, dear Lord, why am I letting these people do all this stuff? No, I'm telling you, no. But I turned him around and I said, being surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, cast off every weight that may so easily hold you. <laughs> Look to the Lord, the author and the finisher of your faith, and we laid hands on him. Let me tell you, he walked different, he talked different, and he lived different, amen. And I'm thankful for another church that helped get him an apartment. And he, when he passed away, he passed away in his right mind, set free from alcohol, amen. But that opened the doors at the little Inglewood Church of God because it wasn't long till I had about 15 men stroll in one Sunday morning. And let me tell you, they stood out, amen. It looks like they had just got up from the gutter because they had, amen. There was a new ministry called True Purpose and they were looking for a home church and they rolled these guys in and they would come in and sit in our church and I watched those guys get saved. And then one long till we had a bunch of young ladies coming in and they were all part of a ministry that you had to be pregnant and addicted to get in the, into the program. It's one of the only ones that I know in the state. They have had 34 babies born, every one of them drug free. There is no medical explanation, amen, for what God is doing there. Hallelujah. So I love that. And then the next thing I know, there's an Episcopal church that's got a like a halfway house. They started showing up. And let me tell you, when you pray, God send whoever you will. You better be ready for whoever you will. Some of my people, not many, but a few, they were uncomfortable. They said, I don't know about this. And I said this, let me tell you, if we don't exist for those that need the Lord, we don't need to exist at all, amen. But I'm telling you right now, I've got musicians and I've got youth workers and I've got people all over the church. I've got people in the parking lot and at the doors that came out of all those ministries, amen. I've done more remarriages lately than I could have ever thought about because God's a restorer, he's a healer, he's a deliverer and it's his hands that are still reaching and touching and delivering and if you got people in your life do not give up I'm telling you you are on the brink of Jesus walking in your room and saying peace be unto you because I know the handiwork of God is still moving and flowing amen through his hands flowed resurrection power he restored a young man to life. He's walking and a funeral's going by. And I don't know if the funeral messed up his plans or what, but he just stopped and said, we'll take care of this. Laid his hands on the casket and out popped. I'm sorry, my mind's like a jack in the box. <laughs> Bow. A dead boy in a coffin comes alive. I just want somebody in this place to understand and know that the same Jesus that walked in that room is the same Jesus that's resurrecting lives, amen. It's the same God that is sitting on the throne, amen. It's the same one that Philip said, I see Jesus standing on the right hand of the Father. It's the same Jesus that is moving in our midst, amen. And we've got to start believing that God can do anything. Amen. I hear stuff. 
I don't believe stuff. For a long time there, we, I was told multiple times, somebody's on meth, they'll always be on meth. That's a lie from the pits of hell. Because I've seen the handiwork of God. I've seen meth addicts set free. I've seen fentanyl addicts set free. I've seen heroin addicts set free. I've seen families brought back together. Amen. It was during the COVID that a young lady come in for the first time, sit in the back of my church. We're in praise and worship. She comes up and I ask her, what do you need? Are you, what do you need from the Lord? I said, do you know the Lord? Are you saved? She said, well, the life I'm living right now does not indicate or reflect my salvation. So, so she said, I want to rededicate my life. And we prayed. I thought, hallelujah. She went back, sat down. I preached, gave the altar call. Here she come back. And then she looked at me and said, I'm a, I'm a heroin addict. I'm about to lose my job. I've lost my family. I've lost my children, and I don't know what to do. We laid hands on her. She was anointed, and I think she was slain in the spirit at that moment. She got up from the floor. She was set free from heroin. Amen. She went back, told her uh, employer what was going on. They said, you get in that, uh, their Celebrate Recovery program. You can stay working here. The next thing I know, and a few months later, she comes in with a, a, a large, happiest, joyful man that I've, I've seen in my church. And she's, she said, this, this is my husband now. We just got married. And I was mad. I said, you didn't call me. But they got married. <laughs> what? They said, this is, said, yeah, we were together five years ago, and we, we, we have a child together. But drugs and alcohol separated us and our child from us. Now every Sunday I look back, and I see Lemuel, I see Victoria, and I see their beautiful little girl sitting with them because it was about a year ago this time that they were re restored. They got full custody of their child back, amen. Their family's been brought back together. Why are you telling these stories? I just want somebody to know the kind of God we serve, amen. That same Jesus is still operating right now. That same Jesus is still setting free, and I'm not going to buy in the narrative when people tell me what God can't do. I'm tired of that. I don't even know why we come to church if we don't believe God can do. Used to, I'd get up early and I'd study and get my mind on. I'd flip through the channel sometimes. We got a local channel there, a local uh, program that came on our local TV. It was called The Good News. I said, oh, let me hear some good news. And the good news was God doesn't heal anymore. God doesn't do miracles anymore. God doesn't do these kind of things anymore. I thought, that's not good news. That's like fiber right there. That's sad right there. Amen. I said, no. So I turned that off. Let me tell you, I came to give you some good news. No matter what you're going through, we have a God that cares for you. And no matter what the enemy's brought against you, God can turn that around for your good. And no matter what you're facing, we serve a God who is able to deliver, restore, and heal. Amen. The hands of Jesus. I've got to move on real quick. But I got to think about the hands of Jesus. And they come to arrest Jesus, and there's a guy there, and Peter gets mad and tries to cut his head off, but he's a poor, he's a poor swordsman apparently, and he just chopped the man's ear off. And this same Jesus reached down and picked up that ear, put it back on that man's head, and healed him as they were arresting him. And you think you're going to bring something to him today that God's going to say, what? No, he's going to say, look at my hands. They're still reaching for you. They're still able to heal you. They're still able to deliver you. They're still able to do what I said I can do. Amen. Because through the hands of Jesus, it's those same hands that gripped the cross that he drug down the Via Della Rosa through the streets of Jerusalem. It's the same hands that were pierced and nailed to the tree as, as Psalms 22 and 16 says, for his hands were pierced for us. Those hands that did that for us and those hands that were on that cross nailed to it, those same hands are the same hands moving in us. And it's the same thing. I love the fact that when he entered that room, it's the first thing he showed him, see my hands. I don't think he was showing him the scars. I think he was showing him his hands. I love the fact that he was wounded for our transgressions and he was bruised for our iniquities and the chastisement for our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. And we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way and the Lord has laid 
on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and us a sheep before its shears is silent. So he opened not his mouth. I love the fact that that's who our Savior is, was and is, but now he's not baby Jesus in the manger and he's not the guy on the cross anymore. But John the Revelator, when he had his heavenly vision and was taken up and he said, I heard a voice and I turned and I saw him. His hair was white as wool. His eyes like flames of fire, and out of his mouth was a two-edged sword. And when he spoke, it sounded like thunder, like many waters. And I fell at his feet as a dead man. That's the resurrected Jesus. That's the powerful Jesus. That's the Jesus that we know right now can help you wherever you are. Amen. So he showed him his hands, showed him his side. Because out of his side was poured out healing for us. I'm reminded, I think they may have been reminded of the story as they gathered together in Bethany and they're all together and here come, here come Mary holding an alabaster box with a year's worth of ointment in it, perfume. And the only way to access it was to break it. And he was broken for you and me that we may have hope and life he said, here's my hands, here's my side, broken for you, given to you, that I really want to get right where I, I needed to get to. Then it says, he breathed on them. He's about to ascend into heaven. He's about to take his rightful place. They're all about to see him go. They're about to hear the angels say, as you see him going up, he will come again. Amen. He breathed on them. When I think of the breath of God, I think of when God made all creation and then on the, on the day he said he formed man in his own image. I won't get here too long, but I'll tell you what, I know where I did not come from. Two cells did not bump in the night and make four that turned into eight and 16 and it became a fish and then crawled out as a bird and then later became a horse and somewhere along the way primates came and then after the primates was tired of being primates they just stood up one day I guess and walked around and they were man that makes no sense to me that requires more faith because scientifically mathematically for all that to take place is impossible beyond impossible People say, you got faith. We believe in science. No, you've got faith in science, and I got faith in an eternal God. Amen. Amen. Yeah, but, well, the Big Bang, you know, we had the Big Bang Theory. Some gases come together, and they explode. I thought, where did that? You got more faith in an eternal gas than you do in eternal God. You live in your camp, I'll live in mine, amen. Because I believe the one that said, let there be light, and there was, amen. I believe there was one that cast the stars into all creation, and they were put into place. I believe there was one that said, I will make man in my own image, and we are like him. And then I love the fact that when he made man in his own image, he drew a deep breath, and he breathed in them. There is a separation of mankind from any other created being ever existed. Why? Because of the breath of God, amen. And I love the fact that he breathed on them, in that little upper room he gave them that power that breath of life that God breathed in Genesis chapter uh, in the first three chapters of Genesis he's breathing on them in the upper in that upper room and then also my mind goes immediately to Ezekiel the, the prophet who came and, and God said what do you see and he said I see a bunch of dead bones in the valley and he said breathe on them hallelujah and he said that makes no sense and I'm giving you the East Tennessee paraphrase and God said breathe on them because I will revive them and restore them and as he acted in faith as that breath of God represents life and he breathed on him it said those bones began to knit back together and those bones began to have muscle and tissue and those bones started having tendons until an army rose up out of that ground I have seen enough dead people rose back up to life I'm not going to quit believing it why because of the breath of the living God God is still breathing 
on his church. And you know what we need more than anything right now? It's the breath of God. And then he said, go tarry in Jerusalem until you are endued with power. Go tarry in Jerusalem until you're endued with power. So they tarried. And I have to give it to the 120 in the upper room. Ten days. At first, Jesus couldn't get him to pray for an hour in the Garden of Gethsemane. And I can't imagine the conversations that went on for ten days. I know my church's conversation. Why are we here? What's going on? Pastor Scott said to get here until we're endued with power. It's been two hours. It's been two days. It's been three days. Why are we here? What's going on? I think it took 10 days for 120 people to get in one mind and one accord. I'm not going to tell you business, Lebanon Church, Ministry Center. But when you get in one mind and one accord to reach the lost and to get the harvest and to say, Lord, make me a worker because the fields are full. Amen. When we can lean into the Amos 9, 13 promise that says uh, uh, the sower going to catch up with the reaper. Amen. That's backwards. I believe we're living in the last days and I believe God is pouring out his spirit because Joel says in chapter 2, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. We're in the last days. Breathe on us one more time. So they're in that upper room and they're, they're tearing and they're tearing and day 7, day 8, they've probably argued, they've probably fussed, they've probably complained about being hungry, they've probably complained about where we need to go get more food and I'm tired of eating that stuff, somebody go somewhere else and can we not do better than that? But I feel on that 10th day it said and they got in one mind and one accord and suddenly, that's almost comical. They've been there 10 days. But suddenly, 10 days, but suddenly, your suddenly is closer than you think. Oh, I've been waiting on God for a year or two years or three years to suddenly. When we was at at Dyersburg, a lady had prayed for her husband for 85 years. Is it really? Yes. They were 103, and he got saved. Amen. Somebody in here. Your suddenly is closer than you think. The entrance of Jesus in your room is closer than you think. The word that he's about to speak to you, peace be unto you, is closer than you think. Don't give up. Don't throw in the towel. Don't start disbelieving. Don't start looking at, at, at the people that are giving you facts. Don't begin to do all these things. Let me tell you, it is time that we put our faith in him to breathe on us one more time. You got lost family members? Keep believing. My brother and sister, my, my baby brother, they decided they was going to adopt a child. And they picked a child from the Congo, the Demo Democratic Republic of the Congo, and we got her picture. She was an 18-month-old, almost malnutrition-looking little girl named Covey. We couldn't wait to get Covey home. Year went by, we still waiting on Covey. Civil war broke out in Congo, no Covey. Our government decided to make some marital decisions that the Congonese did not like, no Covey. We was in this thing for close, getting on close to four years. Covey was the last one left, I think, in her orphanage. She'd spent her whole life there living on a dirt floor, no electricity, 80% of the time, to the point that she had a picture of Jason and Jessica and Cora, but she began to ask the people in charge of the orphanage, she said, are these people the real deal? Are you just telling me? She began to think, they're just trying to tell me a story to make me feel good. My brother and his wife went over there and visited her for a few days. They went to the consulate. They went to the government. 
nothing we can do, nothing we can do. A few of them said, if you'll meet us back here and if you can give us X amount of money and if you can give us some cash and all that, we might be able to do something. And they were like, we don't have that. They came back as despondent as, any, as a couple could be, heartbroken. We met in church that Sunday morning. I preached on that word suddenly. They were weeping and crying. We anointed them, prayed with them. They got home that evening. They got an email that said, Colby is on the list to come to America. Why? I don't know. I do know. They said, well, we've got to figure out how to go over and get it. No, that's okay. The leader of the orphanage is coming to the U.S., I think, for like a fundraiser or something, and he's flying into Washington, D.C. All right. I began to think of a five-year-old little girl that's grown up in an orphanage in a third-world country that all of a sudden is told you're going home to a place you've never been, to people you've never seen except to. And they lead her to an airport, and they put her on a giant tube with wings. And for about 26 hours, she drives through the sky and lands in a, in a little town, a, a big city of Washington, D.C., where she's met by the two faces that she's seen before. And they get her, and then they load up on a plane, and they fly into Knoxville to McGee Tyson Airport. Here's how God works. Because here's a girl with no family, no home, no life, no, no really no hope, no future. And she's about to go down an escalator at McGee Tyson Airport. Now, the foot of that escalator is probably 150 people with signs and banners and balloons that says, Welcome home, Kofi. People she had never seen to a place she had never been on a vehicle she had never taken. So let me tell you, what, what's that say to you and me? I tell you, when somebody comes in this place and they are bound up in their sin and they are hopeless and they have no idea how they can ever get to this other place. But let me tell you, there is something about entering a place where everybody says, welcome home, amen. You are home, amen. God is working, amen. You can be healed. You can be set straight. There can be righteousness in your life. You can live holy, amen. You can live upright. You can have hope. You can have dreams. You can have a future, amen. And in that moment, she went from having nobody to all of a sudden having everybody. That is the family of God. That is the faith of God. And ministry center, when we take hold of that vision that says, send me the ones that have no idea how they're going to get here. But when they get here, they are ours. Amen. Send me the one that have said, I will never make it. I, 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 let me tell you, I, I got to close the, the, I got to land the plane. But I sat around a table with some young women and they began to give me a testimony about six of the 12 women around that table said, I was, in my, I was living in my car and I was going to kill myself because I didn't think there was any hope for me. And now when I walk by my nursery and there they are working or that they're sitting at the registration desk bringing in other people's kids. How in the world did they get from sitting in a car suicidal to in the house of God serving the Lord? It's because of the power and the ever life giving breath of God and the handiwork of Jesus still moving and still touching and still molding and still developing. Amen. And I'm telling you what, I see that in this church and I have not come with any condemnation but I hope I've come with a word for you that says keep pressing on church. Keep believing. Amen. Let me tell you, you keep asking God, send me the harvest and I'm telling you, he will again. You may not like the way they look when they come in but that's none of your business. You prayed the prayer you got to live with the consequences amen I'll end here I ask God give me 10% of my town if we could have a healthy church and around 150 or so that would be great in the last four months God has took my 10% request and now it's over 30% of what I ask God. He's tripled what I ask him for. We're in chaos and pandemonium at church. 
We have. We, we do not have a blade of grass left, but we have extended our parking lots. We're doing everything. We're looking at two services. We're picking up people in a golf car. We got, I got Santa Claus that drives my golf cart. Amen. It's awesome. I can boast about something, but one thing I know, I don't think anybody else got Santa Claus in the golf cart, but we do. I say this because it's not about numbers, but it is about the vision of God. And when we start believing that all things are possible and all life is important and every soul means something. And when we pray and we cling on to the altar of God and we can hear him saying, peace I give to you, believe in me. See my handiwork. See my power. Receive my breath. We can press on. And I was given just a synopsis of the vision here. I see it full. Three years ago, I had a church full of unemployed guys for a short season. They said, Pastor, we need, to, we need to get on the balcony. Let's build the balcony and open it up. We built the building for it. Let's do it. I said, let's do it. We did. It's not huge. It added 120 seats. There's no room up there now. I don't know where I'd be without it as I see what God's about to do in this place. There are souls walking the streets of this town and this area and this county. I keep telling stories, I'm sorry. When we built our new building 15 years ago, a Baptist church had done this and I stole it from them. The only thing I've ever taken from a Baptist, no, I'm teasing. <laughs> I got an end, but I know. We poured our slab, and we had the rough part. We had our stage roughed in and concrete floors, and I went and bought a truckload of Sharpies. And I don't know, about 100 of my people, I guess, come in, and they began to write prayer requests on the floor, praise reports. Underneath our pulpit are scriptures about preaching the Word of God. I have had people come to my church that have knelt down to pray and a relative or somebody in my church says, you don't know it, but you're kneeling on your name. So when we recarpeted, what, last year or so, and we pulled it up, people said, can we do that again? Because I got new people. I said, let's do it. But what caught me off guard, I began to walk my floor. I began to read what other people had wrote. There's a lady that didn't even attend my church as she does now. Her daughter was struggling with seizures and right over here on the side of our stage there was this long note by this lady who I didn't know at the time who had wrote please heal my daughter of her seizures and she just listed this big prayer request and now I see him every Sunday sitting in there whole and healed amen let me tell you that's the God we serve so we added a bunch more prayer requests to the floor and a lot more scripture but I'm telling you, you believe it. I think it's Habakkuk that says, write it down. Amen. That's what we need to do. Ministry Center, that's what you need to do. Because I believe in the promises of God, and I believe the window of heaven is wide open. And I believe that God's about to bring your family home. I believe he's about to restore relationships. I believe he's about to heal people. I believe he's about to set people free. I believe he's about to take addictions off of people that other people say it can't happen. I believe that's going to take place in this place as long as you believe. And as long as you have faith. And as long as you allow the Lord to say, I give you peace. Look at my hands and let me breathe on you. God's about to do something unbelievably great beyond our comprehension because I know if he can do it in Podunk, Inglewood I can't even imagine what's about to take place here so I'm going to give you the opportunity I don't know how you arrived today I say this at church all the time it's inconsequential to us how you come to church it is of the utmost importance how you leave our church you say what do you mean by that Every, whatever brought somebody in my doors, I thank God for. Well, could they not dress better? Probably not. Do they not have any? They probably don't. Could they have cleaned up a little bit? Don't care. 
how they arrive. None of my business. How you arrive this morning, none of my business. But how you can leave this place is my business. And you can leave healed, and you can leave restored, and you can leave peaceful. You can leave with God in your life. You can leave forgiven. You can leave set free. You can leave restored. That's what you can do. Every head bowed, every eye closed for a moment.